Hey everybody, and welcome to this first video in the CCNA series. So before we get started, I want to kind of talk about a little bit about me and like my experience and then like the CCNA in general so you have an idea what you're getting into. All right, so first, um, you can call me Mac. Uh, I work at a community college uh, in Southern Ohio. And over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I've always been in IT. Um, I started at the help desk and became a telecom administrator, became a network engineer, uh, and finally a director of IT, uh, and then I started teaching. So over my course uh, from CompTIA, I've had A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Security+. Plus. I still like CompTIA. Um, I liked it better back then because like, when you got certified, it was for life, um, and you didn't have to retake it every three years, which was nice. Uh, I went through the whole Microsoft thing, like when you took one test, you were an MCP, and then there were four core exams, you would be a Microsoft Certified System Administrator, MCSA, uh, and then if you took the, uh, the two electives, I think it was two more, or three, maybe three more, uh, you were an MCSE, uh, and then they changed their whole program and got stupid and became every test you took where you were an MCTS, Microsoft Certified Technology Specialist, so I think I took three or four of those. And then depending on how you stack those up, you became an M a Microsoft Certified IT Professional. So I think I had two of those. Uh, and then after that, I just, it just got ridiculous and I kind of quit doing it. I think they're back to MCSA, MCSE now, but I'm not sure. Um, and then there was EC Council. Um, I was an EC Council Certified uh, Security Analyst, uh, Certified Ethical Hacker, Licensed Penetration Tester. Um, and I quit doing the EC Council stuff too because they just became so greedy as a company. One, they started kind of giving out their stuff. Like I had this uh, woman that was a, a department chair. She never had a day uh, of IT in her life. And she went to the EC Council, paid them $500, and gave them some bogus uh, letter from a friend verifying that she had, you know, five years' experience um, doing security for IT. And they gave her the EC Council certified uh, CIO certificate. I'm like, what? So, plus now, um, it used to be. Like if you took the CEH, then every uh, every three years you'd have to either recertify or every year you could go to their system um, and put your training in um, and they would award you points. If you had so many points within three years, um, they would just renew your certification for you. But then they changed it. So now um, for the EC Council, not only do you have to get, after you get certified, you have to continue to pay them money to be a member. Otherwise, you can't put your credits in there uh, for training. So you can't like get uh, extend your uh, certification. So it's ridiculous. And then with Cisco, um, I have CCNA, CCNA Voice, CCNA Wireless, um, and then CCNP uh, routing and switching. So in the early days, it was just CCNA. Now they have a couple different CCNAs and CCNPs. Uh, so, and the focus of this course is gonna be CCNA uh, routing and switching. All right, and like CompTIA, you know, any Cisco exam that you take and you get certified, um, there's nothing else, like you can't go to like some training site and put it on, like in your training um, to extend your certification. You just have to retake it every three years, which I, I guess is a good thing. Um, it's kind of a pain in the butt for me because um, I'm teaching it all the time, so I, I guess it's a little bit easier for me to take the exam. I can't imagine being in the field and, and wanting to uh, renew those exams every three years, um, especially when there's a lot of technologies that you don't really have access to or you don't really play with. You know, as a network engineer, there are going to be things that you don't, that are covered in these courses that you're never going to really touch a whole lot. You know, ACLs is one thing. You know, if you work for a company and you're with that same company all the time, once your ACLs are in and they're working, you don't really play with the ACLs a whole lot. Um, BGP is not, it's a routing protocol that you're not going to play with a whole lot as a, working for a regular company. So there's a lot of different things on there that as a regular networking guy that you're not really going to see a whole lot, which kind of, is kind of a pain. All right, but let's talk about the CCNA. So you can do it two ways. You can either take the two exams or you can take the one accelerated exam. So the two exams are ICND1 and ICND2, or you take the accelerated exam, which is just the CCNA. And the number changes every couple years as they update the exam, so make sure you're always taking the, the current exam whenever you sign up for that. So 200-125 is the current exam listed on the Cisco website um, as of October uh, 2018. Now, if you take the CCNA, I think it's a flat $300 for the exam. If you take the ICND-1, it's like it's like $165, then ICND-2 is like $165. So either way, you're going to end up paying at least $300 for it. So where do you go for training on this stuff? Well, uh, 
if you go to the Cisco's website, you can find your nearest Cisco Academy. And your Cisco Academy is um, it's, it's usually a community college um, or a regular college, or even at, nowadays there's high schools that have these academies where the instructor is CCNA certified. They're also a Cisco certified academy instructor, so they've been through the academy course and they've been certified. And there are four components or four classes for the CCNA. Um, there's CCNA 1, 2, 3, and 4, Introduction to Networks, Running and Switching Essentials, Scaling Networks, and Connecting Networks. So if you take it, like at my community college, there's actually four, com four separate classes. So it would take you two years to knock these out, you know, first semester, second semester, third semester, fourth semester. So you get the idea. So keep that in mind. Um, it, it, it's a lot of stuff to do, and we'll get into more of that in just a minute. All right, so what's the good thing about taking the CCNA? Why would I want to take the CCNA? What's the good part? Well, the big thing is, you know, the CCNA, Cisco is king. If you've got your CCNA, everybody else kind of looks up to you. Um, you know, Microsoft doesn't compare. As far as entry-level uh, certifications go, um, CCNA even kind of trumps the MCSE. You know, because there's so much content in the Cisco exam that if you've got your CCNA, you've kind of proven you know routing, you know switching, you know IP math, um, you know troubleshooting, ACL. There's just so much content in there that you're kind of like, as far as networking goes, you're the king. So it's great to kind of have that prestige. But if you're working at a small company with 100 employees, three servers, and one router, uh, I don't know necessarily know if that's going to help you. So really, you have to think about what you want to do. You know, Cisco is an enterprise level company. All their stuff is um, enterprise. You know, now we're dealing with Chicago and New York and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, if your aspiration or where you're ever where you're working at is a small ranking company, 100 employees or less, you're not really going to get a whole lot of benefit out of the Cisco, the CCNA. All right, and that's the good stuff. So now the bad stuff. Um, one of the first things that this tough and why the CCNA is so prestigious is the large amount of content in the exam. If I go to Cisco's website, here it is, and here's all the topics on the exam. You're like, oh, it's seven topics, no big deal. But if I click these, bam, you can see, I mean, you have to know all the stuff about the OSI model, and you have to know all the different switching technologies, and you have to know all the different routing tech. That's a lot of content, and we're only through the first three. So again, bad thing is um, some of that content. Uh, it's so it's just a large amount, and that's why um, I typically recommend for people when you take the if you're going to take the exam, go through CCNA one and two, and after that take the Net Plus exam first. Net Plus is way easier than, than taking you know the IC and D one. So take the Net Plus. That'll kind of get your feet wet with certification if you've never taken a certification exam before, because um, it's kind of you got to figure out where to go and you got to pay your money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you don't want to waste that money. So take the, I, I would recommend taking CCNA 1 and 2 classes and then knock out your Net Plus. Net Plus is a vendor neutral kind of thing. Uh, and it's not as specific as Cisco is. So it, it's usually a good one to get your feet wet in. And then after that, um, see how you feel about taking the ICND 1 and then not maybe knock that out and kind of go that route. All right, second bad thing. Certification is a revenue generating division of Cisco. So if you think about it, now Cisco doesn't release numbers. They used to, I think we'll say a long time ago, maybe over 10 years ago. Um, but I'm guessing there, there's about 250,000 CCNAs on the planet. There are about 100,000 CCNPs and about 50,000 CCIEs. Now, I might be off a little bit, um, but it's probably higher than those except for the CCIEs. Um, there are not a whole lot of those guys. You know, CCIE is just internet focused. So if you take those numbers, the, the 250, the 100,000, the 500, that's 400,000 people that have to certify. Now, the CCNA and the CCNP exams are 300 bucks a piece, and you got to take them every three years. So that averages out to be $100 per year. So if you take all that stuff and you multiply it by $100 or $100 per year times 400,000 people, that's $40 million a year that Cisco is putting in their pockets. And that does not include the training classes, um, all the books and material that they put out. You know, Cisco has their own publishing arm, Cisco Press, um, that prints out all their books, all their training material. Um, a lot of these training places, like uh, as an academy, we have to pay like a, a company um, to support us through Cisco. Like Cisco doesn't support us themselves. They have another company that kind of does it for us in our area. And we pay them every year, and they give a cut to Cisco. And then you got to figure out how many people fail these exams. You know, the, the CCNA is, has a pretty, I don't want to say, 
about a 50% fail rate. You know, people that usually end up taking it twice. So when you think about it, you know, the CCNA, just, just the, the Cisco program itself, probably generates closer to $100 million a year for Cisco. And that, again, we're not even talking about like the CCIEs. You know, a CCIE has to fly down. I think there's only two spaces where you can go, like Texas and California. Um, and you got to pay for, you know, plane ticket and hotel room. Um, then you got to go take the exam. And I think that exam is like $1,000. So it can get pretty pricey. Um, so, again, because it's a revenue generating division of Cisco, I don't want to say they're kind of skeevy because it's not necessarily skeevy. But. I swear, and I have no no proof of this, but I swear they have two different divisions like that. The people that write the books for the certification classes are in one division, and I want to say they're in the U.S. because the books read really well as far as English goes. So they seem to be English-speaking people, like English is their first language. But the certification exams are sometimes worded so poorly that you got to wonder, are, is this... Are these written by people where English is their first language or their second language? I almost want to say that the exams are written by people in India. So now you've got two different divisions, one writing the books and one writing the exam, and the stuff doesn't necessarily match up, and there are actually some, some wrong answers in there. And there's also some very obscure stuff. Now, I teach CCNA, and I teach all four phases um, probably every semester. So I'm pretty familiar with like what content is in the book. You know, I, I have the, the paperback books. I have electronic versions of the book. So I can, I can search things pretty fast. There was a question on my, and I just renewed my CCNA over the summer. So there was a question on my CCNA about um, um, RSVP. And I was like, you know, I remember that from CCNA voice. So because I already had the voice certification, I was just renewing my CCNA. I knew the answer to it, but I'm like, I don't remember that being on the, in the CCNA program. So I looked through the books. One um, sentence mentions that in the CCNA3 Scaling Networks book, and that's it. That's the only time it's ever mentioned. And I was like, holy crap, here's a question from one of four books where it's only mentioned in one sentence out of the four books. That's ridiculous. So you've got those weird, obscure questions like that. And then you've got other questions like this. And I took this from a, a dump site. So it's saying, you know, match the cable. So if I'm doing a switch to switch, I need to do a crossover cable. If I'm doing serial to serial, it's a DC DTE. PC to console cable is a rollover. But then they're saying PC to router is a straight through cable. And I'm thinking, what? And this was actually on my exam. And I remember kind of struggling with this. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. A P if I put a, a straight through cable into my PC, it's going into a NIC card. And if I put the other end into the router, it's going into the fast Ethernet 00 or fast Ethernet 01, which is also a NIC card. So if I'm going from a NIC card to a NIC card, there's no way a straight through cable would work. So I don't know what world they were in when they came up with that question, but it's just ridiculous. As far as that goes, um, on my CCNP exam, I was taking the troubleshooting exam to renew my CCNP, and this question came up, and basically in troubleshooting, they give you like this huge network, and you have to figure out like all these tickets and what's wrong. So the ticket was, you know, something didn't work, and I so I go, I find the router where the problem is, and I know it's a NAT problem, so I do a show run, and it shows me that both interfaces are set for the inside. Well, obviously, that's not going to work. One needs to be inside, one needs to be outside. So I'm like, oh, that's easy. And but, but luckily, I was thinking, well, let me look a little bit deeper. So then I did a show IP NAT statistics, and then both interfaces showed as the outside. I'm like, wait a minute. They're trying to trick me here. You know, had I not known, had I, for some reason, had I not done the show IP NAT statistics, I think I would have missed that question, which really kind of irks me. You know, I mean... A show run command is never going to give you the wrong information. You know, it's not going to say that they're both on the inside if they're both set for the outside. That just didn't make any sense to me. Uh, I guess unless Cisco is trying to admit that their stuff sucks. So I was a, a bit perturbed after that exam, seeing questions like that uh, that are they're deliberately kind of designed to kind of throw you off to get you to say the wrong answer. So, and I guess the only purpose to that would be to get you to pay for another exam so they're going to get another $300 out of you? I mean, really, Cisco? Come on. And Cisco has been cracking down the last couple of years um, on uh, different sites that have dumps and stuff. So it's a lot harder to find questions. I, I guess I'm kind of mixed about that. You know, for me, because I'm teaching the same thing every semester, CCNA is kind of easy for me. But I keep trying to envision myself, you know, if I was just working at a company and I'm, all, I'm not doing the, the most, like, ACLs all the time or natting because once you once you nat you're done like you don't ever have to nat again and with all the changes in technology and stuff it's really hard to kind of keep up 
So one of the things that has always uh, kind of helped Cisco stay as a premium certification is that the pool of questions was always so large. Like you could never just go to a dump and remember all the Cisco questions because there were usually like 600 to 1,000 questions in the pool. So there's no way you're going to remember all that stuff. So it was pretty safe that like if you passed the CCNA, you were solid. It wasn't like Microsoft. With a Microsoft exam, there might be 50 questions on the on the test, but the whole pool is only like 100 questions. So it's like, pff, that'd be pretty easy to do. And I'll admit that back in the day, you know, I used to go to like Test King and, and just crush those Microsoft exams. Now, I think one month I knocked out three of them because they were so freaking easy. But I digress. But so now Cisco is really cracking down on any website. Like you can't go to Test King and get Cisco stuff. Um, and if you do, it's just, it's crappy stuff. Like it's not ex actual exam stuff. Um, so they're really kind of cracking down, which is good because then it kind of keeps your, your certification, um, you know, nice. And, and you don't have everybody and their mother out having the same certification as you. Uh, and it really proves that um, you know what you're talking about. But on the bad side, it's a lot harder to find um, material when they're asking you so obscure questions like RSVP on the CCNA. Um, or you get a BGP question like, wait a minute, we didn't even talk about that. Or hot swap routing protocol just just kind of I don't know I'm kind of on the fence about that uh, on the one hand I, I think for students and, and people new to the thing it's nice to have a study guide even if you just go through the 600 questions to kind of oh well, hey here's something that I you know I need to study work harder on this area that's great but if you're just trying to memorize the whole pool obviously that sucks and that's stupid um, it's not gonna work for you because it, it eventually let's say you go out and you memorize all 600 questions like how you do that I have no idea but I digress so I remember 600 questions, I take the, C the Cisco exam, and I pass. And then I go get a job. And they're, they're going to expect me to know how to, how to set up a router and how to do different things. Well, if I just memorize the questions I didn't take it, I'm going to get fired pretty fast. So I think that kind of like took care of itself a little bit um, as far as Cisco went. So I don't know. I don't know if they really need to be out there hammering all these different sites. Um, some of them, yeah. I, I guess not everyone. I don't know. So again, I'm on the fence. All right, and lastly, if you have no idea what Cisco does, um, Cisco does enterprise level infrastructure. So the things that you don't see are from a, a desk. So when your PC plugs into the wall, where does that cord go? Um, it goes into a patch panel, then it goes into a switch, and then it goes into a router, um, and then a router routes it across the internet to the other offices. So that's kind of like, like where Cisco is. Uh, and their big competition is uh, Juniper uh, and Palo Alto. Ooh, and then one more thing. Uh, another reason that Cisco test is kind of so hard and so prestigious is it's all command line. Like there's there's no GUI. Like if you go through any of the course material for Cisco stuff, they they never push the GUI, which is kind of weird. I mean, it's nice because then by the time you're done, like you really know that stuff and, and you know the commands and you know how everything works. But when you compare their stuff to some of the competition out there and how much easier it is, like Cisco firewalls, oh what a pain in the butt. Um, for about eight years, I had my own company, and we would try to steer people away from Cisco ASAs um, because they were such a pain to set up. And, and if you ever had your Cisco ASA and somebody else had an ASA and you had to create a VPN tunnel, their ASA was always going to be easier for them to do, and the settings were always going to be different from yours on the Cisco. So it was always a pain in the butt trying to get settings to match to make those VPN tunnels. Like if you go through SonicWall or something like that, their uh, firewalls, are all GUI based, so you just, you just got a screen comes up, you click a couple things, you're all done. Where with Cisco, it's like, oh, I got to type in a whole bunch of stuff and blah, blah. And it's, it's all labeled weird and it's hard to find. Anyway, so I digress. So that's your introduction to the CCNA. Uh, and after this, we'll start with the first video.